Hello and welcome to the Friday, February 2nd, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Today in my diary, I expand a little bit on, well, uh, what top level domains are and what this means for identifying domain names. Typically, of course, a domain name would be two labels, the domain name and then the top level domain, but that's not always strictly true. Typically, a domain name is sort of considered something that belongs to an entity, a company, an organization, and then they may assign host names, subdomains within that domain name, but uh, those domain names then have some trusts with respect to each other. Well, uh, there are some interesting domains like, for example, co.uk that behave like a top-level domain, meaning, as Mozilla puts it, that domains being assigned within co.uk may be owned by mutually untrusting parties, basically different organizations. Organizations. So if you're trying to define a domain, then you first need to figure out what are these sort of pseudo top level domain, I want to call it, or as they're officially called, public suffixes. Luckily, Mozilla maintains a list of public suffixes. There are about 9,500 uh, domains in that list that should be treated as top-level domains when it comes to security. One effect of this is cookies. You cannot assign a cookie in current browsers to a public suffix, just like you can't to a traditional top-level domain. So if you're writing some scripts that, for example, try to identify unique domains or uh, what's the most frequently visited domains and the like, you need to consider this public suffix list. Luckily, there are Python libraries and such that will read it for you and then extract domains considering the current public suffix list. This list is constantly updated. I looked a little bit at the GitHub history of that public suffix list. It looks like it's about updated uh, twice a week or so. And then we got some interesting updated guidance from CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, when it comes to Ivanti Connect Secure. Now, this, of course, applies to U.S. federal agencies. If you're not working for an affected agency, uh, this is still interesting guidance to use to, for example, justify similar actions in your own network. And they're very specific here that as soon as possible, no later than end of the day, Friday, February 2nd, you must disconnect all instances of Ivanti Connect Secure and Ivanti Policy Secure Solutions from their agency network. So they highly recommend that you disconnect the device. Then in order to bring it back and connect it back to the network, you need to export configuration settings, do a complete factory reset, and then rebuild the device per Ivanti's instructions, and then configure it again, and so on. So essentially what this means, and I think this is at this point valid guidance when it comes uh, to these Ivanti instances that uh, have been unpatched, that have been actively attacked, is assume compromise, only a complete factory reset gives you some assurance that the device may actually be clean when you then reapply the configuration. You should also reset any passwords and revoke any certificates that were used on the device prior to applying any patches. Even if this advice is not necessarily binding to you based on the organization you're working at, I think it's a very strong vote for being overly cautious as you're dealing with this incident, given the numerous exploits that we have seen, that others have seen, that uh, were targeted against these uh, devices. And please also make sure that you check with Ivanti support if they have any updated guidance or if they have anything for customers like indicators of compromise or such that you could look for in addition to doing the reset, in particular if you're trying to, for example, review the configuration that you may have extracted from the device. 
And Cloudflare today released a very detailed uh, blog post that uh, describes an attack against Cloudflare on Thanksgiving last year. Of course, being attacked on Thanksgiving is uh, never pretty, but yes, attackers do sometimes take advantage of holidays like that. A couple lessons here. First of all, the sort of root cause of this was the Okta compromise and tokens stolen in the Okta compromise were used to then attack Cloudflare. Secondly, there are a number of security measures around zero trusts and such that apparently really helped uh, Cloudflare here. So uh, good lessons learned here on sort of what worked, what didn't work as far as detection and prevention of the attack, at least uh, prevention of the attack spreading uh, to sensitive systems. Overall, uh, well, uh, Cloudflare did uh, get away pretty easy here, given that their security measures appear to have worked uh, pretty well, given the critical nature of Cloudflare as far as today's internet is concerned. Well, uh, nice to see them being quite open about what happened and allow us to learn from it. Okta also independently announced today that they're laying off more staff uh, to save costs. And just a quick side note for everybody who is going out today or going to receive in the mail their Vision Pro from Apple, you may immediately be prompted to update the device. Apple has released updated firmware that fixes one of the WebKit vulnerabilities that was recently patched in other Apple devices. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for giving me good ratings in your favorite podcast platform and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.